Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we ask that you would prepare us for this word, that you might fill us with your truth and light and love, and that we might go out and share this with all those we come into contact with. Anoint us, Lord God, for you have called us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In our scripture reading this morning, the apostles were doing what they believed they were commissioned to do. Unfortunately, this conflicted with what others believed and how others lived. In this particular instance, the apostles' witness conflicted with the ideas of the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem. Later, in Acts chapter 19, Paul's witness will conflict with the town of Ephesus and the economy that revolved around the worship of the goddess Artemis. The result is that Jerusalem is in an uproar, and the disciples are repeatedly hauled before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious and political council, to account for what was happening. The earlier stage of our scripture reading finds the disciples in prison because of their witness. But why? They just wanted everybody to know Jesus loved them, didn't they? After all, isn't that the essence of the gospel message? If this is the case, something doesn't quite compute. Nowhere in Acts does anyone proclaim Jesus' love? Such a benign message would not land the apostles in prison either. While we are not given a clear reason as to why the leadership did not agree with the disciples' proclamation of Jesus, it is clear that they were doing something disagreeable that brought about their persecution. But we should not too quickly demonize the Jewish leadership. They, just like the disciples, were acting out of their own convictions and their own concerns. Perhaps the problem is not just what the apostles said or did, but rather how they went about doing it. According to Acts, the apostles were imprisoned and warned because of their teaching about Jesus and the healing of the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. This was not okay because it was not from the temple. In other words, they were drawing public attention to themselves. It probably did not help that they were drawing public attention to carrying on the message of a Jewish man who was executed on a roaming cross a message that not only upset certain conceptions about God anointed one, but also implicitly challenged claims associated with Rome's rule. After refusing to obey the Jerusalem authorities' orders to keep quiet, Paul and the apostles find themselves on the defensive in a courtroom setting. The Sanhedrin remind Peter did we not tell you to keep quiet? Peter's first response is not, Oh, I'm sorry, sirs. We shall not go about publicly proclaiming the name of Jesus any longer. Instead, what he says is the equivalent of giving the authorities the middle finger. His call from God to bring others into relationship with him through Jesus was too important in comparison to this human call by the authorities. Now the leaders, they have unwittingly called attention to the reality and have signaled their doom when they refer to the disciples' teaching in the name. It is the name, after all, that identifies and makes present this witness to the risen Lord Jesus. There is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This name carries a power and authority that must be obeyed. 
It is the necessity of God's promise of salvation. The disciples' testimony pushes directly to the heart of our gospel. Jesus was put to death by hanging on a cross, but God raised him and exalted him to a position of power and authority, death and resurrection. This is our truth. Now, ancient rulers often identified existence in their kingdoms, whether by establishing new law or by being law themselves. Peter's statement in verses 30 and 31 uses language that commonly described ancient rulers, leader and savior. These two verses bring Jesus' rulership and his crucifixion together, highlighting the offense of calling Jesus Lord. The God of our, of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. And then God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. This powerful and poetic statement can be summed up in terms of overturning. First, the actual death of Jesus is overturned by God's resurrection of him. Jesus' death is not the final word, but for Acts, it is the path into new life of repentance and renewal. The resurrection legitimizes and empowers the witness of the community, symbolizing that death to the ideologies of power and dominance in the old system results in new life. Now, second, Peter's statement overturns the meaning of Jesus' death by relating it to God's exaltation of Jesus. Jesus' lordship over all is achieved through the cross. It is important to see the juxtaposition of Jesus' death and his exaltation as ruler and savior. The defining element of Jesus' lordship and thus the economy of his kingdom is one of overturning earthly powers and dominance. The cross is his red carpet that leads to the lordship of Jesus and defines his kingdom. If ancient rulers defined the nature of their kingdom, then Jesus' kingdom is very unlike anything the disciples knew from the Greco-Roman world of the first century. For in Luke chapter 22 it says, But Jesus said to his disciples, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. The rhetoric of obeying God rather than humans serves to highlight that ceasing from public proclamation of Jesus would be submitting to the power-hungry modes of existence that typify our world. Jesus' resurrection says there is something better. Now Peter's short message concludes by proclaiming repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Ultimately, the entire public hubbub relates to God's offer of repentance and forgiveness. The disciples' message that challenged and called Israel to God is brought not in judgment, but as we see throughout Acts chapters 2 through 4, in acts of renewal and forgiveness. The disciples' message is full of peace and power and authority. God is brought not in judgment, but in the extension of his forgiveness, which are extent even to those who scoffed his message and found it offensive, like Paul. 
public proclamation of Jesus in obedience to God rather than human needs intends not to cut off those who oppose us. It intends to serve and even to suffer for doing it, pressing on to witness to God's renewal of all things. Now what the disciples were doing seemed like they were going off the deep end to much of the surrounding world. The Pharisees and leaders certainly seemed to think this. Drawing attention to the public proclamation of Jesus as Lord is indeed crazy. This crazy train, Peter is clear to note, does not have a human conductor. And God is taking this train right off the rails. The current rails on which the train journeyed was no longer bringing God's forgiveness and renewal, but were actually hindering it. Jesus is our rail, and there is no one that is going to take us off track. We have this calling, this sanctification from God to go out and speak the word so our neighbors will know the power that is Jesus' name. Jesus has the power to heal and to bring order, to calm and to empower. Each of us has a job to do while we are still here on this green earth. We must speak Jesus' name to all those who might hear and to relay the wonder that is his victory over sin and death. Is there anything more important than this one message? That the eternal kingdom and God's presence are available to all of humanity? No. God is knocking on your heart in this moment. There is someone you come into contact with that needs to know the truth. Are you willing to be God's vessel of sharing it? The Holy Spirit, my brothers and sisters, has anointed you to speak the word. She will envelop you and give you what you need to say in that moment. It really is an awesome experience. No matter what the authorities might be telling you, the gospel has to be shared. No one can silence us. Jesus was put to death to be silenced. Instead, he was amplified. The disciples were flogged and imprisoned and eventually also killed. Each instant was nothing more than a trophy, one for witnessing to the Lord. We cannot fear the repercussions of speaking Jesus' truths in public because of religious tolerance. We must offer our neighbors abundant opportunity to realize their connection with God through our Lord Jesus. For every obstacle that comes before us, because of that sharing, we should look at it as if we are awarded a trophy for our witness as the early disciples had done. God does not give us a spirit of weakness or fear. Own your spirit of power and authority and bring that good news to all. Because we, we are witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has come into each of our lives and touched us in individual ways. Ways that we needed to become whole through him. That completion is offered to all by God, and it is through us that that is communicated, in person or by phone, through text messaging or online, or even through art. God knows how he will use you. Trust in that knowledge and go forth. How has Jesus changed your life? How do you know that he is the risen Lord? the Messiah for all of creation. Let the Spirit work on your heart. You were transformed by the power of Jesus' name and your belief in that power. The Spirit can and will use that to transform others. Witnessing in our everyday lives is what we are called to do. It is an amazing feeling to be able to do so. For instance, last night, 
I was at the yard house and three guys came in to enjoy the atmosphere and to watch the basketball and the hockey game. They weren't there to listen to their waiter or expect their waiter to ask and care how they are. But I was able to show the care that God first showed to me. We were able to discuss the current state of affairs of their lives, nothing that they were expecting for the night. And while they were currently celebrating, they were missing a cause of celebration that we have every day through Jesus. Being able to share the cause for such celebration, that through Jesus' death and resurrection, we become new, complete people, called to answer for what we are called to do. The Spirit will work on our neighbor's hearts to accept it. Planting seeds of faith is what we have been called to do. And we can do this. Planting these seeds with all that we come into contact with, even though they might write you off at first, because it's not worth the effort. God knows everyone is worth our effort. So speak that gospel. This lesson provides an occasion to hear and announce that Easter message once again. Now coupled with the bold witness and confident life in community that it evidently inspires. We too join these early witnesses in the sure and certain truth that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that God has exalted him to be our leader and our savior and has done so in order that we may receive God's gift of repentance and forgiveness that is ours in the present and living power of the Spirit. Whoa! As we gather around our table this, this morning to remember our Lord's Last Supper, our Lord's resurrection and death for us, let us be fed by the Spirit so that we can be embodied and emboldened to share God's word and Jesus' truth. Remember, my brothers and sisters, that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. 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 <laughs> At this time, would you stand with me if you are able and join with me the communion hymn, number 695, as we